Every human child is told to fear the boogeyman. Every alien child is told to fear the humans. Ever since they were introduced to the Greater Galactic Council, they were feared and hated like no other. It all started when a Takesh probe stumbled upon an inhabited system, MX-150, named after the probe designation and being the 150th discovery, it was simply studied from orbit. Nothing of immense technological significance was noted, and the probe continued its scouring of the stars. This doesn't mean the probe saw nothing interesting, however. Of the things on the surface, intriguing to put it simply, horrifying to all those who look closely. The beings on the third planet from the sun were of particular concern to the categorizing eye of the Takesh Confederacy, and as such, a small fleet of science ships was sent to investigate further. What they found was shocking, to say the least. Transcript of Audio Thought Log 1 When I first arrived in orbit around this planet for which there are many names, I was shocked, Nolat muttered. The way life existed down there was beyond all logic and reason. Many species on the planet exceed the maximum size of intelligent life, yet these are the species that dominate almost every corner of their world. Nolat stopped for a moment to comprehend what he was about to say. Our understanding of xenobiology has been shattered, he thought to himself. They defy logic and well-established scientific principles, and yet they exist. Why? Why should any species have an internal skeleton that encompasses organs meant to control the intake of oxygen and other organs to digest biological matter? How did an intelligent species evolve without the energy from photosynthesis? Clearly such life existed on this planet, Yet somehow the descendants of landfish were able to take a leading role on the planet. Uh, more study is needed. We know so far that they are animal life without the ability to photosynthesize. No singular system of bodily function. No energy for which to develop significantly without the intake of biological material. Nolat could barely comprehend what he was saying, and the next words slipped out of his mouth without even thinking. I could really use some help over here. End log. His request was granted. More help would arrive a year later. They arrived at the planet just as a major conflict was erupting on the landmass that the creatures, humans, referred to as North America. One colony of the dominant power of the world was revolting, using primitive explosive chemicals to propel kinetic materials as weapons. While crude and primitive, such a weapon would already be capable of killing even the mightiest Takesh individual. By galactic standards, the Takesh were some of the largest and strongest individuals around. They stood at a massive five units tall. Humans would refer to this as 4.5 feet or 137 centimeters. Humans blew past this height, standing at 5.5 feet tall on average. Some even grew to the giant seven-foot mark, and they weren't even the largest species on the planet. War being waged on one's own species was common, for the humans anyway. But casualties were in the hundreds, hundreds in every single battle. This revolutionary war had tens of thousands of casualties. Unbeknownst to everyone, the worst was yet to come. Shocked by the horror of such a bloody war waged on their own people, the scientists opted to abandon their posts. Suffering psychological trauma so great, not even the most powerful treatments in the whole galaxy could ease their suffering. It wasn't that war didn't happen between member states of the council. In fact, it was extremely common. But no wars had ever been waged between people of the same species, except for on human worlds, that is. For 140 years, the Takesh stayed far away from Earth and its horrifying occupants. Sadly for everyone who went back, their timing couldn't be any worse. The ambitious Krell had taken up an interest in the humans and offered to take the research station off the Takesh duties. They gladly accepted this request. Only a month later, the human Great War began. For four entire years, the Krell watched in horror as humans charged at one another with much more potent weaponry than only 140 years ago. Machine guns, bolt actions, artillery, tanks, planes, bombs. The horrors fielded by the humans know many names. Most worrying of all was the rate at which such innovation had occurred. It took them less time to go from lackluster steam power to total industrialization than the fastest such speed known to the Galactic Council by a factor of ten. Not only were they deadly, but they were industriously so. By the end of it all, 
Over 20 million humans were dead. Every single Krell who witnessed the spectacle firsthand killed themselves. 50% of those who were informed of the sins committed on the surface went into immediate shock. Once again, they left the research station abandoned, unwilling to ever gaze upon even the surface of the world below. Now, though, the world had sparked the interest of the head counselor of the Galactic Council. She wanted to find out how the humans advanced so quickly. Unfathomably, she would never receive an answer to her question. Roughly 20 years after the Great War, another science team was sent to the planet. What they found shook the entire galaxy to its core. The humans were on the cusp of splitting the atom, something they thought impossible to achieve only 20 years ago. War once again reared its ugly head. This time, 75 million people would die. Such news led suicide rates in the entire galaxy to go up by 15% for the duration of the war. It got so bad that misinformation informing people that none of it was real was distributed as gospel across the stars. From here, things only got worse. They split the atom, then they went to space, then they decided that focusing on being able to kill each other more times over, then the other guy was more important than space. How they managed to not entirely obliterate their entire civilization still amazes and saddens the Galactic Council to this day. Finally, on one fateful day in the human year 2407, they broke the code to FTL travel. This, by all known models, was completely impossible. Humans had very little of the resources to create an FTL drive, but they didn't need them. Instead of warping space-time like a normal race, they decided to do something else. Utilizing dark energy's ability to repel things, they used it to stabilize singularities between two points in space. They called this a wormhole drive. Once the spaceship entered the wormhole, it collapsed on the entrance side. Space then slingshotted them out the other side. Remarkably, it was just as fast as the FTL drives made by the most technologically competent races in the galaxy. Yet somehow they were able to do it. Reluctantly and with great fear, the Galactic Council readied a diplomatic mission to introduce humanity to the galaxy at large. It was only five days before the diplomatic mission was scheduled to begin when an unknown contact entered the Council's capital system. It seems to most historians that the humans were simply tired of waiting. Somehow, intercepting, deciphering, and understanding GCL, Galactic Common Language, they made first contact before we could. Transcript of Audio Thought Log 2. And so I proclaim the galactic ban on Guatov Fruit Rati. The head counselor's speech was cut short by a deafening boom of static, followed by a careful tuning and eventual silence. Hello? Can anyone hear me? Asked the voice of Chancellor Jill Tyron leader of the Human Space Coalition. This is Chancellor Jill Tyron, leader of humanity. Stunned silence enveloped the crowd, followed by countless gasps and whispered remarks. Yes, we can hear you. Kutan hesitated for a moment. This is Kutan Omala, High Counselor of the Galactic Council. Let us talk face to face above the planet's surface. Kutan began to shake with fear. Were these the same humans that slaughtered millions of their own people? The same ones countless debates into whether or not military intervention to stop their brutality was necessary. To her dismay, it was revealed to be so. The flickering static of the screen above her slowly faded into a clear and sharp image of a thin bipedal creature, strong and gargantuan staring down upon the room. Where do you wish us to land? responded Jill. She wondered silently to herself why she detected a hint of fear towards her. Not just the fear of the unknown, but a deep terror coming from the eyes observing her. She was certain, however, that whatever misunderstandings between humanity and the aliens could be put to rest. Land at the station in orbit. Council, you are now dismissed until further notice. End log. Counselors streamed out of the gargantuan main hall and out into the crowded streets of bliss, the capital of the galaxy. With layer over layer over layer of city encasing the whole planet, at least two trillion called this world home. How much danger are they in? With humans in orbit, they surely couldn't have been safe. Still, Kutan marched her way to the teleporter complex, not knowing if she'd survive the other side. With a single leap of faith, she immersed herself in the teleporter's event horizon. No going back, she thought defeatedly. 
Maybe I can ward off their aggression and survive their bombardment of abuse and horrors. Certainly, this will be even more dangerous than the Takesh first contact. At least they were able to prevent themselves from harming one another. She felt her body deatomize and almost instantly reatomize at the station. There she found five humans looking around with their gargantuan jaws agape. Their undivided attention fell upon her, making her more nervous than she had ever been in her entire life. This place is amazing, said Jill. Keep your vacuum suit sealed, though. I don't want to infect our new friends with any human disease. In front of her, a blinding flash of light began to shine in a cylindrical object. Jill covered her eyes and looked away. Was this some kind of trap? As soon as she began to have second thoughts, the light faded. In its place stood a three-foot-tall quadruped that appeared to be made entirely out of plant fibers. She soon realized that this was none other than Counselor Q-Tan. She looked down at the creature scurrying closer towards her and extended a hand. Jill hoped that the creature knew the meaning of the gesture. Q-Tan seemed to hesitate for a moment, but then, after careful deliberation, she extended one of her graspers and the two shook hands. Under the surface, however, Kutan was scheming on how to best rid the galaxy of these humans. She had been terrified of them before. But seeing them in person, it was simply too much to bear. They were gargantuan, surrounding themselves in crude suits of fiber and glass. They were young and should be dumb. Instead, they have discovered a completely new kind of FTL travel and are bringing their warmongering to the stars. Execute human protocol she whispered into her microphone. Suddenly, all the walls began to shift, revealing monstrous robots, five feet tall each, marching into the hall. The humans looked confused and stared around them. Seeing the robots marching around, Jill decided to approach one. It attempted to grab her hand, but Jill easily pushed it away. The force of her push was able to completely topple the 100 LB behemoth. Jill turned and looked curiously at Qtan. I think your greeting party is malfunctioning. Qtan stood in abject horror, their most powerful defensive robots, capable of manhandling any known species in the galaxy, was simply pushed over by a human. Abort, abort! Qtan was frantic, praying to the makers that the humans wouldn't be angry about the attack. She looked at Jill with pleading eyes. It's all right, I appreciate the gesture, though. These robots will be great for manual labor on asteroid mines. What do you want for them in return? Jill asked and looked towards Qtan with enthusiastic eyes. The look she got back, however, was confused. Qtan struggled for a moment, thinking of how to respond. Y you can have them for free. Her voice cracked with fear as soon as she saw the human's eyes light up with joy, however relief washed over her. They didn't know this was meant to be an attack. They thought it was a gift for their mining operations. One thing was for sure, however, Humans were the most dangerous race in the galaxy. Qtan wasn't yet done trying to rid herself of them, but such measures were for another time. Thank you for your generosity. We also have a gift for you, responded Jill. Soon, a sixth human entered the chamber with a large mechanical object being carted in on a dolly. For peace and prosperity between our peoples, Qtan glared scrutinously at the object. What is this? she hissed. Some kind of human weapon? Oh, yes, that is a fusion reactor. We figured that since you are plants, you could use this to grow and develop yourselves. Jill responded enthusiastically. We noticed in our previous scans of this planet that no fusion power was on its surface. You still use nuclear fission, yes. Yes, of course, Qtan replied dumbstruck. It is four times as powerful as your fission reactors. Hopefully, such technology can benefit you. Yes, I will find many uses for this replied Qtan. She was even more terrified than before. Suddenly, she came to a grave realization. How many star systems do you inhabit? Jill's response was swift and shocking. 550 as of today, the number is steadily increasing with the advent of our FTL drives. Without realizing it, Jill just confirmed Qtan's greatest fear. They had spread too far to be contained. Without realizing it, Jill just told Qtan that conflict is inevitable. Interesting, very interesting indeed, muttered Qtan. I must get back to the surface and inform my people. A diplomat will be sent up shortly. Thank you for your generous gifts. Before leaving, Qtan scanned the object for later replication. 
It is my honor, however, I will also be leaving. Human diplomats will arrive within the hour. I hope we can have cooperation between our great peoples. Jill walked carefully back to her ship and glanced behind her. Qtan had gone down to the surface. Run, she yelled to her troops as she had figured out Qtan's plans the moment the robots attempted to attack. Alarms began to blare all over the station as the humans scrambled towards their ship. As soon as Qtan was on the ground, she screamed to the station operator, Shut it down now! The humans can't be allowed to leave! But, Counselor, the station is important for trade. It doesn't matter. The humans can't leave with any of the knowledge they have. Blow it up! The operator gulped, but did what he was told. Self-destruct activated, he said in a high-pitched voice. Why do we need to destroy them? Isn't that against our morals? The operator's protests fell on deaf ears. For years, I have studied the humans from a distance. Only their home planet, however, their military technology has been successfully deciphered and recreated. We must destroy them to prevent their deeds from reaching the populace. It would cause too much devastation. Citizens of Bliss looked up to a burning sky. An explosion had destroyed one of the orbital stations around the planet. Mass panic and confusion erupted across the planet when suddenly all the screens in the vast ecumenopolis switched to a live speech from Counselor Qtan. My fellow citizens, today a group of aliens known as the humans has destroyed one of our stations. I barely escaped with my own life. We are now in a state of war. Ready yourselves for a final conflict. Ready yourselves to fight for the very survival of our Grand Republic. Punch it, Daniels! Jill screamed. She was soon pushed over by the tremendous force of acceleration. Crashing into a nearby table, she felt one of her ribs crack and she screamed out in pain. The ship lurched again as a massive explosion propelled it back out into space, throwing Jill across the room once again. Jump back to Earth, we need to warn them. Coils are charging up, jumping in five, four, three, two, one. Everything seemed to compress and push in on the ship for a moment. Then everything went back to normal pressure. The view screens of the bridge showed only pitch black swirls around the ship. We gave them the fake fusion reactor, right? Jill huffed, exhausted from the mad sprint to the ship from the station. Yes, we did. Hopefully we will beat their first contact ships to Earth, replied Captain Daniels. Why, I thought that this was going to be peaceful coming into this, Jill said. She still had no idea why a sentient bunch of space plants would want to blow them up. Their first contact fleet wasn't a bunch of science vessels. Detailed scans show a full battle fleet of over 200 ships. Daniels revealed, they wanted to destroy us before we could pose a threat to them. Good God, hopefully we get home in time to throw out the welcome mat. Jill winced from the pain of her shattered rib. Somebody get me some morphine. On it, replied Hank, her head security officer, as he jabbed a small needle into her chest. The pain went away and she began to think clearly again. Make sure weapons are fully charged before we jump back into the system. Don't know if they'll be far behind us. Jill was clutching at her chest as the pain began to come back. With labored, painful breath, she observed the displays. It had been a torturous four hours since the jump into FTL. Almost there, she thought. Hold on, yelled Hank over the deafening whine of the wormhole drive. You're going to be fine. Boom! The ship groaned and slowed as it came back into real space. Jill was deafened and thrown into her restraining harness by the whiplash of the deceleration, pushing against her shattered rib and making her yelp in pain. Daniels, get on a line with Congress, barked Jill through gritted teeth, and get us to a hospital stat. Yes, ma'am, Daniels replied, tugging on the control stick and banking hard right. Nearest hospital is in orbit above Neptune, ETA 10 minutes. Patching into Congress now. Thank God for FTL, though, Jill thought. That might be what put us into this mess in the first place. FTL travel, anyway. Communication was trivial in comparison. All you need for FTL communication is to be able to detect one of the countless micro wormholes caused by pockets of dark energy. These were everywhere, and so data was transferred through one with an extra burst of energy, allowing it to emerge from the wormhole at its required destination. Then any normal radio dish could pick up the signal and communicate with the sender in almost real time. The average delay being roughly 1.5 seconds each way, no matter the distance. 
The sound of static reverberated through the spacious bridge, slowly tuning and patching into a video call of every single congressman and congresswoman in a large domed chamber. The grand halls of Earth's great Congress, an assembly of representatives for every single one of humanity's colonies. In the center of the screen was Vice President Barry Willis, running mate and good friend of Jill's. So how'd it go? Asked Barry with a toothy grin and strong southern accent, his one biological eye gleaming with excitement. Then he and the rest of the Congress saw the condition of Jill and her crew. Countless cuts and scrapes littered their bodies thanks to the very fast and unceremonious scramble out of harm's way. Jill's mouth and nose were leaking blood, and everyone looked like they were very shaken up. What the hell happened? Barry asked with a much less excited tone, the grin on his face gone, his mechanical eye turning red, his face contorting with barely contained anger. Not well, Jill sputtered as she began coughing up blood. Aliens tried to blow us up while we were leaving. Enemy ships might not be far behind, en route to Neptune Medical Center as we speak. I'll send the Jupiter garrison to assist. What caused this? Barry demanded. He was seeing red and couldn't believe the audacity of an alien species attacking the president of all people. Aliens fear us to the point of hatred. They were readying a strike force to attack Earth before we got there. Jill replied, exhausted from having to talk so much. I'm sending you all the data we were able to collect and all the info we gathered from our short time there. After about three seconds, Barry nodded and said, got it. Also says there was a hack by the aliens. What did we lose? The locations of every human colony, several pieces of weapons technology, and many cultural details, said Daniels. They could attack anywhere. Congress erupted into an incoherent babble of whispers and general chaos. Barry didn't even try to restore order, muttering a single word, shit. After multiple minutes of frantic discussion, calls back to home systems, and a full military alert issued, Jill broke through the chaos once again. Make sure all of the defense stations are ready to go all across the Republic. Make sure the public on your worlds are informed. As of today, there is a new emergency measure. Jill paused, making sure everyone would hear the last part. All restrictions on personal space-bound weaponry are lifted until further notice. Companies can now sell everything but weapons of mass destruction to the civilian market. With this... Congress erupted into an incoherent mess of cheering and boos, but by the time Jill reached the hospital, every representative had relayed the news of hostile space plants and the fact civilians could own military autocannons. Needless to say, it was a good day for the Mars Manufacturing Group. Good luck, Jill. Hopefully you can get back in commission very soon, Barry said. I'll keep you updated on the news from here. Thanks, Barry, she coughed. Representatives. Make sure the people are ready to fight. Begin standard mobilization of reserve troops. With that, she shut down communications with Congress, and her ship docked with the Neptune General Hospital. Kutan, things in the past four hours have been hell. First, it came to be known that the humans survived the explosion. Second, the populace of pacifists had no will to fight, especially against an enemy rumored to be so absolutely despicable as to slaughter millions of their own people. Third, the humans eat plants, lots of plants. Soldiers don't want to fight an enemy that towers over them, and has also begun to refer to the many plant species as space lettuce. She couldn't blame them, who would want to fight knowing that their body might be picked up off the floor and served in a sandwich. Kutan had three minutes to dispel everyone's fears and also whip the populace into a frenzy. How? Through lies? Scare tactics and sprinkled in small amounts, the cold, hard truth. That speech was about to begin, but her fibrous legs and arms, along with their digits, hadn't stopped shaking ever since the impromptu plan to take human intelligence and kill them before they could warn the others failed. Head counselor, it's time, said one of the numerous aides by her side. She couldn't recall his name. She swallowed her fear and steeled her nerves. Showtime, she thought. She willed her four legs to propel her forward. In a rapid scurry and flailing of movement, she entered the stage and walked up a ramp to where a microphone was sitting. She stretched her four arms, two near her five forward and side-facing eyes, two on the middle of her body, cleared her vocal tube, 
and began to talk. Citizens of the Galactic Council, today is a truly tragic day. I understand many of you are afraid, many against the notion of war. I want to explain the importance of it to each and every one of you. Today we were attacked. A single ship took down a station to gauge our defenses and then report back to Earth. This is the same Earth where millions of humans were killed. By other humans. Kutan scoured her eyes over the crowd to gauge their reactions. Audible gasps and horror filled their faces. This is going great, she thought. If that is what they do to their own, imagine what they will do to us, you, and your families. They consume biological matter. Now imagine a future of endless cultivation, harvest, and eventual slaughter for every single race of this great council. War may be horrible, it may be against our values, but it is necessary. Never in our history has such an enemy reared its ugly head. Kutan once again paused, using silence as a weapon to allow the horror of what she just said to dawn on everyone. Do not lose hope. Our fleets are strong, technology sound, weapons armed and ready. Cast your doubts aside. Replace them with honor-bound duty in the face of evil. Let us go into the stars and cast down not just our doubts, but our enemies alongside them. The crowd went wild, cheering, making noise, and celebrating their imminent victory. Kutan's wildest dreams of success were far exceeded. The humans would have the war they so dearly love. Kutan would have the militarists she so lacked for as long as she could remember. Jill. The state of politics in the Human Space Coalition was, to say the least, a shit show. The discovery of what the human populace was lovingly calling space lettuce was one thing. The legalization of military weapons was a whole other situation. For the past hour, the news hasn't cared about hostile plants in outer space. No, they're concerned about the new laws coming out of it. Jill let reason triumph over her pain medication. Of course, that would be talked about. It was a contentious issue for the past decade. Should civilians have access to military hardware? Up until now, Jill didn't see any reason for it. Trade routes were well protected and piracy was rare. Political opponents, however, said that while rare, piracy is still out there. All of this debate was thrown into a whole different context when hostile aliens were involved. To Jill, it was a no-brainer. She had almost lost her life at the hands of these aliens and saw firsthand one of what would obviously be many more armadas preparing to come to Earth. Some, however, were accusing Jill of being paid off by the Mars Manufacturing Group, MMG, and were against the decision based upon that assumption. The Internet was no better, debates raged, and Jill was in absolute agony. No longer affected by the pain, doctors took care of the shattered rib and gave her plenty of painkillers. She was just out of commission due to the effects the drugs would have on her judgment. She wanted to be at the helm of her ship, steering it through the treacherous waters ahead, constantly informed of the dangers needing to be avoided. For now, though, all she could do was listen to the TV over the hum of the cold and oppressive fluorescent lights. Need anything? asked Hank. I know you aren't having the time of your life in there. Another water would be nice, Jill replied, and Hank walked away briskly. She listened to his footsteps going away for a moment until her thoughts were rudely interrupted by a loud beeping sound. It was Barry to inform her of new developments. He had a frantic look in his eyes. This couldn't be good, she thought to herself. Alien ships have been detected in at least five different systems. Frontier, Harmony, Sirius, Trappist-1, and Proxima Centauri all have 40 contacts each. Call an emergency meeting of the Congress, she replied. Doctor, I need the painkillers purged from my system, Jill yelled, right as Hank walked back into the room with a new glass of water. Still want the water? Asked Hank timidly, his eyes locked on the frantic nature of the screen in front of Jill. Yes, thanks, Hank, Jill said while grabbing the water and taking a long drink. Get the doctor in here. I need to be able to think straight for this. Yes, ma'am, he replied. Show me what's going on, Jill said to Barry. It was about time the aliens would show themselves. Admiral Westman. All right, people, get comms and defense batteries online across the colonies. I need live feeds from Frontier, Harmony, Sirius, Trappist-1, and Proxima Centauri. Get a TAC map up and running ASAP. Yes, sir, replied the war room technicians in unison. Deep below the crust of Earth was the war room command center of the Human Space Coalition. Buried in a mile of concrete, reinforced with tungsten-titanium alloy, 
it was impervious to all but the most powerful ground attack. From here, Earth's Admiralty could oversee battles in any part of space and respond in near real time to give orders and win battles. This battle, however, spanned many of the systems closest to Earth, an obvious attempt to cut us off from crucial supply systems. Admiral TAC map online. Positions are accurate as of 1.5 seconds ago. A map showing the locations of ships, hostile and friendly, lit up on a large table in the middle of the room. It showed holographic outlines of planet ships, civilians, and stars for each of the five systems. Overall, there were 40 hostile ships in each system. The defenses of the human systems varied wildly. Sirius, home of Sirius shipbuilders, obviously had the most defended system. The human 10th defense fleet called Sirius Home, comprised of 10 carriers, 20 battleships, 40 cruisers, 50 destroyers, and 100 corvettes. On top of the numerous lightly armed civilian spacecraft, Sirius would be a tough nut to crack. Proxima Centauri, being the first colonized system other than Sol, was also well defended. With well over 200 billion human inhabitants, it was well protected by militia, as well as the Proxima fleet. The Proxima fleet was a little under half the size of the 10th fleet, still a formidable force. Trappist-1 had the most population of any of the listed worlds, with a little under a trillion humans scattered over its two very habitable planets. The militia alone numbered in the tens of thousands of ships. The defense fleet was not lacking either, 100 capital ships in total. Frontier and Harmony, however, were pitifully underprotected, each with only one billion humans. The brunt of military and militia force was away. The only defense these systems had was the miners in the outer regions of the systems. Understood, get me comms with the lead captain of each defense force. Give me intel on the capabilities of their ships, barked the admiral. He was a gruff and strong man with a long history of space combat. He wanted to keep his troops alive. Static filled the room for a short time. Eventually, five commander's holograms were shown alongside their fleets. Admiral Smith led the 10th Defense Fleet. Admiral Oda with his Proxima Defense Fleet. Admiral Krieger of the Trappist First. Captain Bob Smith of the Frontier Mining Corps, and Captain Will Baker from the Harmony Mining Union. The men stood at attention, waiting for orders and guidance from Fleetcom back on Earth. Good day, gentlemen, let's get to work, said Admiral Westman. Fleetmaster Yechtal. A railgun round slams into the shields of the Fleetmaster's flagship, Vengeful Retribution. The lights inside the ship flicker, and the hull groans as power is diverted from the bio slash metal hull to the shields. He has no idea how long his ship can hold up in this predicament, powerful as it was. The Vengeful Retribution was the largest ship in the Galactic Council's fleet, over three kilometers long, its sleek and flowing hull made of superfine strands of durable plant fibers and iron, glistening under the light of Harmony's sun. The design was permeated with pockmarks of auto turrets, firing irradiated bolts of superheated nuclear waste towards their relentless enemy. The human ships measure in the hundreds. Communications are in chaos, yelled Obata, the vice minister of war for the Galactic Council. We must fall back. Coward, shot back Yektal. We are just getting started. We have very few enemies in this system. We will prevail. Or at least Yektal thought. He wasn't what the humans would see as a sane individual. Ever since he had his frontal lobe removed, he has been unable to feel emotion and lacked reason. In humans, this would be completely unacceptable for military personnel. In the alien races of the Council, however. Aliens of the Council are very apprehensive, and overall completely against military action. Removing the frontal lobe removes all the taboo and resentment towards war, turning what was once a caring or anti-war individual into a killing machine with no consciousness. Yektal and his fleets would have victory, or they would have death. Release the drones, have them scour the asteroids for mines and defenses, Yektal ordered. He needed the pesky autocannons and mining lasers dealt with before he could safely send his fleet of 40 to destroy Harmony. But sir, we will lose most of our- protested Obata before he was cut off by Yektal. We will lose this battle if we don't clear out the asteroid belt. To Yektal it was clear. The lives of thousands of fighter pilots mean nothing if they are going to die in the desolated hangar of their ships, or in the heat of battle above an asteroid. What matters is that they will die, so others can survive instead of waiting for orders. Yes, sir, 
yelled the young Katesh individual at the communications terminal. His voice was soon broadcast all over the ship, the loudspeakers screeching louder than even the blaring alarms. All fighters to battle stations, I repeat. All fighters to battle stations. Well, let's clear out these humans once and for all, Yektal grumbled. Alarms wailed and the fiber metal composite groaned and shuddered as the many thousands of Takesh warriors thundered towards their fighters. Impressive darts of plant fibers, outfitted with strong energy weapons, littered the hangar-like sunspots. The gargantuan hangar doors cracked and popped as they slid aside, allowing the fighters and their brave crew access to the harsh vacuum of space. New Madison, capital of harmony. Loudspeakers wailed endlessly, screaming at the panicked crowd to leave their belongings and evacuate. The loudspeakers called for order. The populace responded with everything but. The city was half destroyed before the aliens even got there. Glass shattered, cars abandoned. Some stubborn few drifted aimlessly through the streets. The impressive city once held 15 million, mostly immigrants from what was once known as the Midwest. The first settlers were from Wisconsin, parts of Michigan, Illinois, and Minnesota. That, however, was very long ago. The Midwest today was a sprawling ecumene. The cities of Chicago, Milwaukee, and Minneapolis all blended into a single vast expanse of metal, concrete, and glass spires. The planet of harmony was much more similar to the states of old than the original lands themselves. Massive cities dotted the landscape of sprawling fields and farms that covered the surface, the cities acting as hubs of commerce and as lifelines into the greater republic, their towering space elevators exporting more than enough dairy, grain, corn, and various fuels to keep the ravenous public satisfied. For the 200 years Harmony was settled, it thrived, it grew, it survived. With the alien attack, its days were numbered. The only question was how many would be trapped on the surface until after it is too late. Will Baker in the asteroid belts of the system, the mining vessels were hanging on by the skin of their teeth. Alien starfighters were decimating the fleet like a pack of wolves, ripping off the limbs of a still-kicking, still-aware defense force. One by one, the brave defenders fell, trying to make a difference, dying in the superheated bolts of plasma that didn't stop coming. Will punched some buttons on his console, beginning a broadcast to his remaining ships. All local units, fall back to the rear fallback line, yelled Captain Will Baker. Born and raised on Harmony, he was determined to see the fight out till the end. If we make it through this, I'll owe every one of you a beer. He once again punched the console and stopped broadcasting. If that's all you're offering, I may as well die now, shot back Mike Wallace, a full-time miner who knew these asteroids like the back of his hand. He also happened to be Will's first mate. It's going to work, but when it does, I need more than just a beer. All right, replied Will, trying to make himself heard over the deafening sound of the hull groaning from their GAU-100 autocannon. It sent 3,000 revolutions per minute of white-hot, 100mm rounds of ammunition towards whatever used to be its target. Due to its immense force, however, it could only fire at a speed of the still-impressive 1,000 revolutions per minute on a small ship like Will's. If it shot any faster, it risked ripping the ex-mining vessel apart. Season tickets to every Packer game back on Earth. Will flinched as a bolt of plasma scraped the shields of the ship, missing a killing blow by only a matter of two or three feet. Deal. Just get us to the rendezvous and I'll bring the hammer down. Will looked around his sensors and punched a button on his flight command center. He began his broadcast to Fleetcom back at Earth. Falling back to rendezvous now? We can't hold much longer, but this will buy us some time. Will paused for a moment to think of words to impress Admiral Westman, but nothing came. Wish us luck. Will waited an agonizing three seconds to get a response from Fleetcom. Help's coming soon. Hold out for a couple more minutes. Krieger is en route to your system, ETA, 15 minutes, Admiral Westman said, his calmness shining through the madness that was the munitions flying all around him. Will then punched another button on his command center, now transmitting to the ships under his command. Everyone fall back to the rendezvous point. Make sure it looks like you're running. Will stopped for a moment, trying to think of something inspiring to say. Every second is another thousand lives saved. Make each one count. Will had no idea whether or not that was true, 
The number of people they saved each second was unknown to him. It seemed to have the desired effect, however. He swore he saw the ships under his command firing and moving a bit faster than they had before. All right, Mike, get it ready, Will barked over the whine of his strained engine. We're on the clock, already on it, screamed back Mike, tinkering with a large device in the rear hangar. The plan was simple, lure the fleet into following them through the asteroids to finish them off, only to detonate a nuclear mine once they got too close, destroying the majority of enemy forces and buying Will and his fleet some much-needed time. It's ready. Mike made a mad dash for the airlock door and stumbled inside. He slammed the emergency door control lever to the closed position and yelled to Will, I'm out, drop it now, and gun it. The G-forces of the sudden acceleration flung Mike into the airlock door. Will was busy informing his troops, Payload is away, get the hell out of Dodge! Will strained the engine past its braking point and willed it to go faster. His sensors indicated everyone else was doing the same. This is Captain Will to Fleetcom, bomb is away. Will switched off the communications and diverted all his remaining power to shields. His sensors went dark, and he hoped that their plan would work. In what felt like hours but was only 15 seconds, Will reminisced about his days as a child, working on his family's farm on Harmony, driving tractors, maintaining drones, caring for animals, all the things he hated most back then. Now he longed for nothing more than to live to do it all again. His daydreams were thrust back into reality with a tremendous shockwave of force. The hull shuddered and groaned, long cracks and fissures forming on the interior walls. The ship shook violently, and several electronics began to pop and spark from the sudden spike in power consumption. The shield strained and weakened as the shaking only got worse. Luckily for Will and Mike, the shockwave passed, and the shields held. Mike tenderly touched the back of his head and felt warm blood. He had cut it on a sharp piece of metal when the ship shook violently. He braced himself against a railing and stood up. His vision faded to black, and he very nearly passed out, catching himself at the last second. He clung to the wall for dear life and limped his way back to the cockpit. Will was busy getting systems back online. They stubbornly refused to cooperate and took far longer than expected to come back to life. Once the communications came back online, he instantly pushed some buttons and began talking to his fleet. If you can hear me, please respond. I repeat, please respond. Will began to panic, second-guessing whether or not anyone else made it. If you can hear me, please respond. Fireteam 1, everybody is still alive. Fireteam 2, all hands on deck. Fireteam 3, multiple ships crippled. No casualties, but we need help. Will breathed a sigh of relief, then asking one final time. Fireteam 4, please respond. The enemy is an ad. We need immediate assista. Will glanced down and saw the sensors begin returning to life. He saw the ships of Fireteam 4 being quickly picked off. Then to his horror, he saw that the alien flagship had survived. Fighters began to swarm at the survivors of the Fireteam, completely exposed and out of the asteroid field. They had nothing to hide behind. The plasma weapons of the capital ship began to shine to their true, terrifying capacity. Ships fell one by one under the might of the mighty battleship. He turned to Mike for assistance, only to be greeted by a strong uppercut to his jaw. Mike. Mike's body was in utter agony, clearly suffering from a severe concussion and quite possibly multiple broken bones. He was in hell. He hobbled his way to the cockpit but stopped to rest about halfway through the hallway. Right in front of him lay an intersection in the ship's hallway. It led left and right to two single-person escape pods. He looked both ways and came to a shocking realization. One of the escape pods had been destroyed. Looking through the viewport of the left escape pod, he saw jagged, twisted metal exposed to the vacuum of space. He wiped his eyes to make sure he wasn't seeing things. To make himself completely sure, he began limping down the hall. It had only confirmed his vision's realization. There was only going to be one person getting off this bird if it came down to it. He began to walk toward the intersection once again, turning into the main hallway and marching towards the cockpit. He carefully observed the situation. He soon saw that the enemy had not been completely destroyed. He then realized what needed to be done. When Will turned to him for assistance, he punched him in the jaw. Will was knocked out cold, 
and now couldn't stop Mike from doing what he was about to do. Mustering what little strength he had left, he dragged Will down the hall. Every muscle in his body ached and yelled for him to rest. Mike kept pushing on. He brought Will to the intersection and began to drag him towards safety. Ten feet, five feet there. He hoisted the dead weight of Will's unconscious body into the escape pod, closed the airlock, and manually ejected the pod. Mike collapsed from the exhaustion of his efforts, falling into a deep sleep, never to be woken again. Will. Will woke up in an escape pod. He found himself alone and his jaw in stabbing pain. His windows offering a clear view of harmony. To Will's horror, it was a blaze. He cleared his head and looked around. Wreckage of ships dotted the space around him. Nearby, he saw the hull of what was once his ship split in two. Soon after, his comms began to cackle. This is Admiral Krieger of the Trappist first. Is anyone left out there? Even Will, in his deteriorated state, could hear the desperation in the Admiral's voice. Will mustered his strength and clicked the device on. This is Captain Will Baker. I am adrift in an escape pod. How many made it? He coughed and massaged his aching jaw. How many made it out? Half the civilians managed to get off the planet before the space elevators were destroyed. The Admiral's voice faltered and trailed off. You, you're the only military left in the system. Will's heart sunk to the bottom of his chest. You did all you could. On the observation deck of the mighty warship stood three of the most powerful men in all of human space. Admirals Krieger, Oda, and Westman overlooked a terrifying scene, an entire planet reduced to a lifeless hell of ash and bone. The Ghost of Harmony was a haunting sight, a specter of what used to be, causing unrest and riots on hundreds of the outer colonies. After all, if the planet of one billion couldn't be saved, what would happen to those unlucky enough to be trapped on worlds of only millions? The argument held water on the surface, but the admirals knew that more isn't always better. If Harmony was a planet of mere millions, the population could have evacuated on time. This reason didn't resonate with the greater public, however. Some in the minority even called for the total recession of their planets from the greater republic. The silence was soon broken by an exasperated Krieger. One survivor, the militia was completely destroyed. I can't imagine the loss that man feels. Once again, the mournful silence returned, each man staring blankly at the still raging fires down on the surface. I will see to it that he and the families of his comrades are well taken care of, Westman somberly replied. I just wish I could have gotten here sooner. Maybe they could have been saved. If only I was less reckless. My ship not damaged, I could have saved more, cried out Krieger. The other two men shifted nervously. Krieger was not in a good state of mind, suffering from a bad case of self-guilt. Westman was beginning to ask himself whether or not Krieger was still fit for duty. Don't blame yourself, Admiral, said Oda. You didn't bombard this planet, don't forget that. The silence once again enveloped them, gazing towards the old cities and farms dotting the surface now reduced to charred patches of gray ash and soot. The gloves are off. Once we finish building up our fleets, they will pay for this day. Their planets will burn brighter than their own stars. They will know the consequence of what has been done. With his final words said, Krieger stormed out of the room towards the elevators. Oda and Westman stood for a minute longer. You need to relieve him of duty. He needs to overcome his bloodlust, Oda muttered. I'm glad I'm not the man who has to tell him. Thanks for the words of encouragement. Good luck. The two men walked to the elevator, plummeting through the decks of humanity's great flagship, down to the fifth floor. Oda stepped out, nodded one last time to Westman, and continued on his way. Westman went back up to the tenth floor, walking down the long, spacious hallway filled with support beams and weapon racks, walking and walking for minutes until he finally reached an impressive blast door. He scanned his hand on the pad outside and it flashed green. Loud pops and thuds were heard as the dozens of metal locks disengaged. The large blast door creaked and wailed as it rolled to its side, revealing a gargantuan room filled with screens, chairs, officers, and weapons command centers. This was the bridge of Westman's flagship, the Human Dawn. Admiral on deck, shouted Vice Admiral Preston Smith, second in command of the entirety of Westman's fleet.
Everyone inside the bridge immediately stopped what they were doing and stood to attention. Hand placed firmly at their brow and still as stone as they waited attentively. The admiral stood for a second, observing his crew and their duties before responding, At ease. At once every soldier resumed their duties. The chaos of it was beautiful, so seemingly random and disjointed in times like this, turning into a well-tuned and orchestrated killing machine when need be. He walked on the long catwalk going to his central command area, admiring the hologram of his ship, 5 km long, a kilometer tall, and a kilometer thick. It was the largest ship in the human arsenal, and very likely the entire galaxy. With over 250 rail guns, 1,000 auto cannons, two heavy mass accelerators, and countless point defense turrets, it was nigh unbeatable. The hangars of the ship carried 500 fast strike fighters, 200 long range bombers, 1,000 troop transports, and hundreds of various logistic craft. Surrounded by a fleet of 15 battleships, 10 carriers, 50 cruisers, and hundreds of destroyers and corvettes, the battle group could turn the tide of a whole war if they played their cards right. The admiral marched to his communications officer, his white cloak streaming behind him, his sleek gray uniform glistening with medals and adornments. His very presence inspired his men to work harder and faster, demanding the best and getting the best performance from his crew. The communications officer turned and saw Westman coming towards him. Sir, he yelled, coming to attention. At ease, I need you to send a communication to Krieger's fleet. Yes, sir. The officer paused over his workstation, waiting for orders to come. Tell them that until further notice, Admiral Krieger is relieved of duty. First Officer Williams should take control. The officer typed furiously into his keyboard. Once done, he looked over his letter for mistakes and sent out the communication to Krieger's fleet at once. Kutan. Once again, Kutan found herself and her council in crisis. The attacks on the humans were widely unsuccessful. Only one planet had been destroyed, but every fleet sent was almost entirely obliterated. The few ships that did limp back to the shipyards told stories of complete obliteration. The destruction of an entire human world also caused considerable headache in the nation. Citizens were outraged and appalled that we should stoop to such actions. They claimed that these attacks were only provoking the humans into even more horrid weapons and strategies. There was no way of knowing whether or not that was truly the case. Intelligence on the humans has been scarce throughout the years, even more so in times of war. Kutan looked out her windows overlooking the city below. Bliss was the most beautiful thing she had ever seen or ever will. The vast spires of fibrous green contrasting with the silver metal, streets filled with people a vast, ever-moving sea of life. The trillions who called this place home were all intricate, delicate creatures, relying on the power sources to provide light for their continued survival. Now, however, she heard a loud crash at her door as it burst open. A young Krell burst into her office. Standing at 3.5 feet tall, he appeared to be exhausted from moving a long distance. A tinge of desperation shone through his eyes, and Kutan was worried this wasn't good news. Hi, Counselor, there's been a leak, the Krell said. There is footage circulating of you being the one who destroyed the station in orbit. The citizens are in an uproar. Kutan shot back around to look at the people she had been admiring mere seconds ago, but looked closely. She saw a clear crowd had formed around the Capitol building, each carrying signs and just barely contained by security forces. Why was I not informed of this earlier? She demanded. Her fury was felt by the young Krell, and he immediately began to stutter out a response. Speak louder! She screamed. The, the protesters c cut the communications. We have been disorganized. It's cut. Ordinated. Kutan's demeanor softened, but her mind began to race. It was much worse than she had expected. Call an emergency assembly of the council. We need to come up with a response. Yes, ma'am. The Krell bounded out of the room, moving incredibly fast. Poor guy didn't have teleporter privileges. Kutan pressed a few buttons on her desk, and a teleporter revealed itself in the corner of her room. She stepped in and was instantly beamed down to the council floor. The grand dome of the council chambers was filled with light as more and more counselors teleported into the room, brilliant flashes of white light temporarily blinding any who looked too close. For multiple minutes, the council was still forming, 
but Qutan could already hear the mutterings of her fellow council members, none of which seemed to be in support of her. She truly needed a miracle to retain power. Harmony system. Has Krieger's fleet responded to my order yet? inquired Westman. It had been multiple minutes since Krieger would have reached his ship. Curiously, though no response has been sent informing him of the transfer of power, Westman was getting frustrated at the lack of response. Nothing yet, sir, replied the communications officer. Give me the damn transponder. Yes, sir. This is Admiral Westman. I am ordering you to respond. Have you relieved Krieger of his duties? Once again, silence fell upon the admiral's ears. He was readying his voice for a barrage of yelling and orders to flow out of it when he finally got a response, but it was too faint to hear clearly. Say again. No. This time the message came clear as day, and it wasn't just anyone who answered, it was Krieger. Krieger, I am ordering you to stand down. Not until they pay for this crime. The sky was lit up by the light of a hundred ships entering FTL all at once. A little over half of Krieger's fleet jumped with him, the other half stood defiantly still. Fleetcom erupted into an incomprehensible mess. Captains of different ships were asking what just happened. Bridge crew were rushing to their censors. Oda was furiously demanding to know what was going on. Westman had an obvious answer forming in the back of his throat. His lips tensed and his face contorted with rage. Krieger's gone rogue. Fleetcom fell silent once again, if only for a second. Now commanders, captains, even Admiral Oda was yelling over the comms. The entire navy was massively disorganized. All Westman could do was pray that Krieger would do more good than harm, but he knew that countless billions of innocent aliens would die. Everyone, find out where he is going. We need to stop him before something terrible happens. Five hours later, Cygnus A system, council space. Commander, we just picked up a blip on our sensors, still trying to confirm. The commander rose from his position and scurried over to the display. The commander's face flushed itself of all color. By the gods, ready all hands, it's the humans. Power to the facility cut, and a human language filled the silence. The commander turned on his translator. It is your time to repent for your sins. The communication stopped, and the censors got a clearer picture of what was out there before the planet of Madrius A was a human battle fleet of many ships. The two billion on the surface sat unaware of the danger lurking above them. The Galactic Council was in for a reckoning. You can't destroy a human planet and get away scot-free. Now the rogue fleet of fifty ships under Admiral Krieger was bearing down on the world of Madrius A. Two billion called the world home. It was an industrial system by plantoid standards. It produced materials vital to the Council's war effort. There was enough justification to put the Admiral's morals aside. No mercy was shown to the 500 million on Harmony. No mercy would be shown here. Sensors lit up like a Christmas tree as thousands of fighters swarmed from the human ships. Weapons fully charged, the poor souls stuck on the system defense platforms didn't stand a chance. They scattered and scurried towards their flak cannons, shooting blindly into the void. One shot hit its target. The aliens cheered and celebrated their small victory before swiftly being blown away by a coil gun. It was a terrible sight. The planet of Madrius A was a lost cause, but this didn't stop the defense fleet from trying. They rushed into battle positions. Fifty ships strong, they formed a defensive line 100,000 miles from the planet. Within minutes, they were being swarmed by the angry hive of fighters and bombers, ripping away at any unshielded components of the bioship defenses. Point defense systems fully charged up. Thousands of rounds per minute of superheated nuclear waste dispersed the angry swarm. The fighters began to turn tail and run. Some ten overzealous commanders pushed their ships forward. The whirring metal and fibers generated enough power to push the hulking living ship forward. Chasing after their enemies intent on thinning the horde, sadly for them, their bravery didn't pay off. Human battleships quickly capitalized on their enemy's mistake. Gargantuan coil guns, rail guns, and missile batteries firing in unison, ripping eight of the ten rushing ships into heaps of twisted metal and burnt biomass. The surviving two ships tried to slow down and return to formation, but the very prey they were chasing once again began to swarm. The two ships were ripped apart by the human fighters in mere seconds. 
Strong and once defiant ships became a dead field of space debris in less than a minute. The defensive line opened up all weapons, trying to keep the horde at bay. Bolts of plasma and nuclear waste streaked through space and split open any fighters who dared get too close to maneuver away. Human ships returned the courtesy, darkening the void with their cold and ruthless kinetic weapons. Traveling at relativistic speeds, the alien ships had no choice other than maintaining massive distance from the weapons. Multiple shots hit their mark. Another five ships were crippled or entirely demolished by the impacts. The human fleet split into three groups, one attacking the council fleet head-on, keeping the most powerful frontal armament occupied. The other groups dispersed across all three directions, moving above, below, and to the sides of the main formation. The three groups coordinated fire, shooting from multiple directions at their helpless enemy. Even more ships were reduced to shriveling plant matter floating in space, as the onboard navigators couldn't avoid all the projectiles swarming their ships. Gunners on board the Council ships shot frantically. They managed to disable around ten human ships by the time they went down in a blur of white light as the relativistic impacts shattered their hulls. Only five alien ships remained. Four of them jumped into FTL, trying to warn the others and get help. The one remaining ship charged at the human fleet defiantly, overcharging its reactor in an attempt to bring them all down. The plan was quickly shot down as the humans also jumped into FTL, going to the other side of the planet. The brave souls of the alien vessel died in vain, surrounded by the dying husks of what used to be their comrades. Now the Mad Admiral turned his sights onto the planet below him, the fate of two billion souls hanging in the balance. He waited long and argued within his own mind about the correct course of action for multiple minutes, before finally deliberating his solution to the fleet. Total bombardment, no survivors, no surrender. Instantly after the order, the anxious gunners lit up the sky, wishing for nothing more than revenge for the slaughter of Harmony. Civilians looked toward the sky of Madrius A. Above their heads they could see hundreds of thousands of brilliant white lights. Like a deer in the headlights, they stood there for precious few seconds. After collectively realizing the lights were getting closer, panic gripped the planet. First came the nukes. Well over 2,000 were fired, wiping out every major city and town on the surface, instantly turning the beautiful green biocities into charred heaps of slag and glass. Well over a billion perished instantly. They were the lucky ones. The next barrage was a hail of 30 feet tungsten rods, ironically named Rods from God. But if anyone was responsible for these weapons, it surely wasn't God. Crashing down onto the surface at thousands of miles per second, they liquefied the planet's crust where they struck, sending plumes of ash and molten rock into the atmosphere. Tectonic plates and volcanoes all over the surface began to erupt, turning the once blue sky into a mess of black ash and flame. In just ten minutes, two billion were reduced to only a few hundred left cowering in bunkers. In fifteen, not a single soul would be left alive. The humans had now become the very monster they so despised, the deep desire for vengeance and destruction completely unlocked. Admiral Krieger was unhinged of his morality, his men blinded by bloodlust. The war had only begun, but it was well on its way to destroying the humanity of those who would survive it. Qutan High Counselor Qutan scurried about her office nervously. She knew the war with the humans would be a necessary evil, but didn't expect so much evil to come of it. What they needed now was a way to stop the human advance. If it wasn't stopped soon, the fate of the entire galaxy was in question. In front of her were the most intelligent scientists of the entire council. Without them, the war would already be lost, but within their minds was the key to survival and triumph in the stars. Or at least, Qutan hoped. What do you have for me? Qutan snapped, her voice shaky and uncertain, her limbs trembling from extreme anxiety. Your lives are on the line. Everyone's lives are at stake. The scientists looked at each other with pleading eyes, obviously trying to shift the responsibility of talking to someone else. Finally, the scientist in the center stepped forward and composed himself. By far the oldest and most experienced scientist, he blinked once and then began to speak. 
We believe there is a way to stop their FTL. He paused and gathered his thoughts. Their FTL relies on space-time warping to take them to a destination. With enough power, we could warp space to prevent entry into a system. Elaborate, Qtan demanded. We will warp space so that it takes the human ships to the outside of the warped area. It will only be crossable by manual and careful navigation. The space would constantly and randomly warp to prevent any wormhole from being stable. In layman's terms, please. They try to come in. We plug the hole. They can't come into the bubble in FTL. What do you need to do this? Every available resource, ship, lots of energy, and a blank check. Get it done. The scientists hurried out of the room. They knew they couldn't protect every system in the council, but they could protect a ring around important star clusters. It wouldn't hold the humans forever, but maybe it could grant them some time. Long, dormant, decrepit shipyards began to come out of their dormant years, once again growing the vast fleets needed to fight a galactic war. Minds long stagnant in years of peace began to once again light up, thinking of ways to defeat the humans. With the destruction of Madrius came the mobilization of an empire. Humanity was going to get their fight. Trappist won. The trillions of masses in the system were in an uproar, riots, fights, destruction, all because of one man, Admiral Gustav Krieger. 30% saw him as a monster and traitor. 30% saw him as a hero fighting the fight. Too many were too afraid to fight. 40% couldn't decide. Pockets of space began to enter states of open rebellion, demanding the government forgive Krieger, demanding they join the battle alongside him. Entire city blocks devolved into open warfare as the two sides clashed, police forces picking sides and joining the fray. If Governor Schmidt didn't get things under control fast, there could be a civil war within humanity's second largest system, something humanity couldn't afford. The viewing screen in front of him flickered red before going blue once more. We can't just absolve him of all charges. He disobeyed direct orders to stand down, President Jill coughed. She still hadn't recovered from the broken ribs due to first contact. If you don't absolve him, my citizens will absolve this government of power. That or go on the offensive, we have the kapa. Don't start it. Congress has to approve it, not me. Only Admiral Westman can pardon him of his disobedience. Then what would you have me tell the people? We'll counterattack in 50 years. Good luck until then. They'd have my head within the hour. Congress will have your head sooner if we go against them. Once they approve WMDs, we will end it. Until then, maintain order to the best of your ability. This is outrageous. How could you... The screen flickered off. Damn it! Schmidt looked out the vast glass panes, gazing at the Trappist IV skyline. Lights zipped up and down the great space elevators of the Ecumenopolis. Cars dotted the streets. Drones dotted the sky. Spires scraped the uppermost regions of the troposphere, the highest spires requiring constant supplies of oxygen to keep inhabitants alive. All this beauty was marred by the occasional explosion that brightened street corners. Sounds of gunfire pierced the night. Fires marked where riots raged on. Dust choked the air where buildings used to be. If the aliens ever got to Trappist, it would be rubble before they ever fired a shot. Schmidt needed a miracle to hold it all together. Trappist 4 is a hellhole. Fifty billion humans are dead, yet people keep going about their daily lives as if nothing is wrong. Ever since the first Florian Infantry Corps has been deployed about two weeks now, every day I've seen another friend die. I thought it'd be easy. We are the mighty Galactic Council, hundreds of thousands of planets, quadrillions of beings. We had the clear, technologically superior force, each weapon being capable of laying ruin to the stars. Or so we thought. When we first arrived in the system, we immediately glassed and cracked every unshielded habitat in the outer regions, well over 15 billion humans dead instantly. The 1,774 ships in our fleet destroyed every human ship in the system. After all, this system's main military force was busy rampaging through our space. We thought it would be some easy revenge. Our ships charged weapons and fired at the main terrestrial bodies. Over two trillion humans live on the three different planets, over half of which lived on the fourth planet from the star. Our mighty cannons belched apocalypse into the void, 
energy hurtled towards the planet. Certain death awaited them. And nothing. The shots dissipated harmlessly across a vast planetary shield that we thought impossible. For months, we sat in orbit, prodding the shield and researching it, trying to get through. Eventually, we found a way to get slow-moving transport ships through, and a ground invasion was planned. Over five billion of us suited up in our exosuits and loaded into the transporters. Five billion packed into two million five hundred thousand ships. Our descent was beautiful, the clouds and skies turning a dim purple in the sunset, only for thunderous flak to shred apart our ships and ignite the very sky. Of the five billion who ventured through the shield, only two billion made it to the ground, deep in hostile territory. I am one of the unlucky ones who wasn't killed by a flak shell. For the past two weeks, I've lived through hell, and I don't know how much longer I have. Our first engagement was euphoric. We the infantry were dropping into a cruel and dead metal hellscape. Twisting spires and other monstrosities of the steel city were turned into churning piles of ash and metal sarcophaguses of their human inhabitants. Terrified civilians mounted no defense and were mowed down endlessly. The neon lights of the cityscape were darkened and charred by plasma fire. The stench of burnt flesh filled the air. Our hulking exosuits, two meters tall, marched through the streets, decimating all that lay in our wake. It was too easy. No resistance had yet been met. It stayed like that for a week, civilians being slaughtered in the millions as we marched unstoppably. Then, on the eighth rotation of the planet, things changed. The once helpless masses of millions now stood defiant in our path. We pushed on, thinking ourselves superior. Then the first shots rang out. Human coil guns wielded by fury-driven militia ripped through our lines. They charged at us with metal spikes affixed to their weapons, screaming blood-curdling noises of rage. One by one, my friends fell beside me, human weapons ripping through armor and flesh, leaving steaming piles of liquefied remains in their wake. The metal hulks of skyscrapers reduced to rubble, lit up with muzzle flashes from primitive slug throwers. Our doubts of their effectiveness shattered when our squad leader was turned into a chunky mist as a slug connected with his torso. Men, women, and children took up these guns and picked shots at us while we marched through their streets. The once dead and cold steel monstrosity they called a city, turning into a fortress of bodies and munitions. People stopped abandoning their homes, preferring to stay and watch us from balconies, sending shots towards us occasionally. That's when we started facing their infantry units. On the 50th rotation, we encountered air superiority fighters and bombers. They began strafing runs on our convoys and supply lines behind the front line, destroying communications and disorganizing our troops. They wore body armor, making them unkillable to shots anywhere except their head. Their guns were powerful enough to rip through 15 feet of Dura Wall and still kill any soldier seeking refuge behind it. They fired at us from well-prepared ambush spots. As the spires of the city got higher and higher, they began to rain fire down unto us from the rooftops. Makeshift vehicles began to assault us, and the once ragtag resistance turned into a formidable foe. Our offensive stalled as human tanks began to crush our lines and decimate our troops. Wave after wave of fresh troops began to seep through the shield, acting as the reinforcements we so desperately needed. Now I began to wonder more about the place I was in. It wasn't some military base, horrid factory of death, no. It was a home. Beneath the rubble and cracked concrete, underneath the flaming hulks of armored vehicles in the buildings now devoid of life, was the once thriving, beating heart of a peaceful people. They lived here and worked here, used the roads we fight on now to get from great spire to great spire. No different from a council home planet, it was a center of entertainment and life, reduced to charred, cracked, and collapsing rubble, all by our doing. I have asked myself the question, what peace are we trying to acquire? When confronted with this question, I told myself that it would all be worth it when peace came. Yet I couldn't answer. I began to see the faces of the people I slaughtered, be it filled with fear, rage, confusion, or some combination. I began to see myself a living being capable of thought. How were they that different from us? Sure, they were animals, 
not made of plant fibers or strands of photosynthesizing material. Yet they were alive, living in cities that they created for the sole purpose of life thriving and surviving here. Now on the final push towards the shield generator, I gaze upon the scarlet sky. Lit by the fires of human civilization, the desolate wastelands we leave behind. I can see the lights in the distance of families going about their lives, people walking the streets. Here near the core, even while fighting raged in the streets below them, humans continue going to restaurants, theaters, homes. Uncaring of the horrors beneath them, occasionally they glance down, see the battles, and admire the view. We have reached a point of such extreme population density that we do not have enough ammo to cut down the masses of humans. I can see people driving past us, above us, the bustle of uninterrupted city life simply flowing around us. The lights of the city and the sounds of conversations screaming louder than any gunshot ever could. I have decided now that this means one thing and one thing only. We are invaders in a foreign land, on a planet of people who wish for peace and prosperity over war, and we are the ones bringing true evil to this galaxy. We are the ones filled with bloodlust and hatred, not the humans. It was lies, all of it, and now I can't kill another innocent soul. I can't go any further than this point. It is pointless to fight them. Note found next to the body of Captain Krell Onabura, who died from a single gunshot wound to the side of the head. His suicide was not the first, nor the last, self-inflicted casualty among the infantry. Jenkins, I need some cover fire. Covering. Jenkins began to fire his coil gun into empty space, his dislocated shoulder blaring with pain as each shot recoiled into it. He saw an alien round a street corner before being decimated by one of his Mach 3 tungsten slugs as it shredded through its chest. His battle buddy, Johnny Ramirez, ran with his head tucked low, running to the safety of a Duracrete pillar five feet to the right of Jenkins. Only 20 yards behind him, a mass of people and traffic went about their daily lives in the deep core of the city. Grenade out! Two more aliens rounded the corner, only to be blown apart by the searing hot shrapnel that turned their fibrous bodies into a burnt paste of biomatter. They could hear gunfire above them, on a catwalk over 500 stories above their current position. A businessman was raining lead onto some faraway invaders before heading back inside his home to eat a sandwich. In a space elevator waiting pad, a mob of humans was using their fists to beat to death a squad of aliens who were trying to infiltrate the area and destroy the tethering cables. Once in space, the people boarded a craft and sailed right past the blockade. There were simply too many ships to shoot down. In other sectors of the planet, situations were much the same. Nightclubs remained open, and the people remained dancing even as the building they were in was collapsing. War and death had become an average part of life on Trappist IV, and people stopped caring. Loudspeakers across the city blared music and inspirational speeches, leading billions to take up arms and slaughter the alien invaders before losing interest and heading back home. With every passing minute, the alien advance slowed. Now it was expected that one single inch of land could be taken for one million alien infantry. Yet the shield generator still lay hundreds of miles away. It would cost the aliens billions upon billions of troops to take just a small portion of this planet. Yet the population was mostly unscathed. Every once in a while, the aliens would come across humans fighting each other. Gunfire was being slung from faction to faction, and rubble already clogged the streets and choked the air. Once the aliens arrived in such a place, the humans stopped fighting, and immediately neutralized the alien threat, then swiftly began fighting again. Trappist was the rock that the council was beating itself upon. And yet, this rock had barely even been scratched. The worst was yet to come. Once the Florian Guard pushed through this small band of the residential ecumene, they would meet a great industrial ring, a wall of factories churning out war materials at maximum efficiency. Tanks, drones, planes, guns, bombs, and worst of all, flamethrowers. Week three came, and all hell that was once contained broke free. Human soldiers filled streets wielding flamethrowers. Entire legions of the Florian Guard were burnt alive, the smell of burning wood and cut grass filling the air. 
Burnt biomass littered the streets, only to soon be trampled by humans rushing to and fro their work. Tanks rolled through the streets, crushing hundreds under their treads, churning their bodies into fine green sludge. Their guns thundered throughout the night, and more and more ground was retaken. Once the human forces had pushed elements of the guard to breaking point, they sent planes to bomb the already abandoned parts of the planet, turning this invasion into a mass grave for all things that photosynthesize. A chemical called Agent Orange was sprayed indiscriminately across the charred remains of a bustling city. Lifeless husks of the alien invaders lay strewn throughout the rubble, only to be ground down to dust by thundering human boots. The remaining 50 billion of the Florian Guard race back to the extraction zones, but human air power is absolute. The ground forces of humanity march onwards, overrunning the Florian Guard with every step. Of the 5 billion initial troops, none survived. Of the 145 billion reinforcement troops, only three survived. Those three were able to survive because they stole a human fighter, flew it to the edge of space, and hailed their fleet. They were rescued by one troop transport that flew through the shield and swallowed up their fighter into its massive loading bay. All three soon after died from exposure to Agent Orange, their survival being covered up. The invasion was over, and Trappist IV kept living. Qutan needed a miracle to stay in power. Outside the great dome of the galactic chambers, billions protested the government she was so desperately trying to prop up. Fiery speeches and clever human subterfuge were wreaking havoc on the entire galaxy's ability to wage war. She had hoped the destruction of Madrius would galvanize support within the galaxy, giving them one final resolve to destroy the humans. For a time it was like this, and she used emergency powers to retain her position as the High Counselor. The assault on the Trappist system was meant to both demoralize the humans and make her populace forget her scheming. Her plans went horribly wrong the second the first glassing bolt was fired. Trappist's planets were protected by planetary shields. No bombardment could get through. Eventually, scientists figured out how to get slow-moving transport craft through the shield. Thus began the most disastrous ground invasion in all of history. Log update. High Counselor Qutan, 14th day of impeachment hearings. Over 5 billion troops were sent in the first wave. Only 2 billion reached the surface. We kept pumping more and more resources into the planetary invasion, but the humans wouldn't give up. For the first few days we had success after success, we secured a landing zone and gained a foothold. Our troops marched through deserted street after street, the expanse of the ecumenopolis seemed overwhelmingly abandoned. After one human week, things changed. Our troops, now numbering 50 billion, began encountering stubborn militia. People decided not to leave their homes, but instead to stay and fight. Their weapons vastly overpowered ours, destroying warrior and machine alike in single shots. They struck from everywhere, street corners, the tops of high-rises, in crudely armored vehicles, in the sewers, from stores, and even inside the desecrated hulks of abandoned cars. Casualties were enormous. Over one billion each day would perish at the hands of the militia. And yet, we pushed on. This militia got more desperate, deliberately strapping explosives to themselves, buildings, cars, destroying entire legions of infantry in single attacks. They sacrificed their own lives to buy more time for the coming storm. On the third week, our troops had reached one of the gargantuan industrial rings of the planet city. There, our troops were greeted with hell. Tanks, airplanes, artillery, bombs, anything you could imagine, they hit us with it, hard. Then came the drone swarms, indiscriminately firing at anything that moved, decimating our supply lines and troop columns. The skies rained death, and the ashes of our troops choked the sky. Human militia proudly stood at the gates of this great factory. Emboldened by their new toys, they smiled in the face of death and spat at us with never-ending volleys of gunfire. In just three weeks, we were pushed back off the planet. Of the 150 billion we sent throughout the invasion, none survived. The populace once again turned against my government. 
The situation is so dire that the long-ago forgotten articles of impeachment have been rediscovered and pushed forth by my counsel. End log. Hi, Counselor Cutan. Your research lead is on the line. Her stupor was interrupted, and she stammered a hasty reply. What? Your research lead is on the line. Oh. Patch him through. Static filled the brain of Cutan as the neuroline was connected. Seconds later, she heard the ecstatic ramblings of her researcher. Blah, blah, blah. Humans. Blah, blah, blah. Legal precedent. Blah, blah, blah. Extreme counsel decision. In layman's terms, Cutan interrupted. Get down to the council library now. You need to see this. Cutan nodded to her security detail, and he punched in some numbers on his wrist pad. She felt her body transform into pure information before being rematerialized in the library. Grand arches lined the ceiling of the seemingly infinite white room. Server racks surrounded every corridor in almost every visible direction. She was slightly annoyed that the researcher would take her this far back into the reaches of galactic history, not even bothered to be taught in schools. What could be so important down here? mumbled Qutan as she began to walk down the immense corridor, scanning each branch for any signs of her researcher. Hi, counselor! Over here! Qutan stopped and looked towards the creature prodding at one of the countless servers. An immense sense of anger filled her mind. Surely nothing important is here. This better be worth my time. It is, I promise you. Qutan walked to the data terminal that the young researcher was working on and began to gaze upon its content. She shoved him out of the way and began to read the article he had been deciphering. Discovery of sentient animal life. Galactic Council record approximately 4,000 years ago. Today we deliberate on the correct path forward from this discovery. The crusade to cleanse habitable worlds of any and all possible predators has been going on for millennia, yet we never thought we would uncover any sentient life. Yet on this fateful day we have. Galactic law prohibits the genocide of any sentient life. However, it has no definitive answer on the rights of sentient animal life. Clause E-279 of the Bill of Rights for Intelligent Species states no plant life that shows the potential of developing intelligence may be interfered with. No extermination of intelligent life may be undertaken without reason or probable cause. Any extermination of a given species must be authorized by both the Galactic Council and Acting High Counselor. The debate regards whether or not a species being an animal is justification enough to eradicate it. It is known that this species possesses intelligence and has not acted aggressively towards our republic in any way. However, the planet is a very desirable one for colonization. It is unlikely that our very different civilizations could peacefully coexist. Until a unanimous vote can be reached, a quarantine zone around the system will be enforced and no record of its existence will be spread to the public. Extermination Protocols Enacted Special measures have been put in place to ensure the delicate ecosystem of Earth will not be destroyed. Regrettably, this means the non-sentient animal life of the planet will be left unchecked. This will be corrected over a prolonged time. The pristine and diverse biosphere of Earth will be left unharmed. The humans will not be so lucky. Ground troops have been mobilized and dispatched to the planet's surface. Many of the largest civilizations on the planet are being destroyed. Stragglers will be picked off at later dates. There have been some reports of organized resistance slowing our advance. Rumors have begun to spread amongst the troops of our technology being used against us. Our generals and officers on site reassure us that these are but baseless rumors. We mourn the loss of intelligent life, but are certain that we have made the right decision. An intelligent predator species given enough time would wipe us off the galactic stage, which can't be allowed to happen. Troops refuse to continue extermination. The war effort has been put on hold as the armies invading Earth are refusing to mow down the humans. Below is the testimony of a general who spearheaded the mutiny. I didn't think about it all that much at first. No different from any other extermination. That was before I marched through the first couple of cities. It was like looking at some textbook about early civilization. Just reversed. I saw things that I never thought were possible for animals. Their cities were immense and filled with life and hope. They all worked and toiled away, 
making progress inch by grueling inch. And we just mowed them down. Have you bureaucratic fucks ever seen the look of fear on someone's face before you obliterate them? The horrifying screams of a mother losing her children? Families running to find shelter that doesn't exist? Because now I have, and so have my troops, I'll send you the videos we have, and then you tell me how this war is justified. This is a mindless slaughter of innocent people. This is genocide, and I won't be a part of it any longer. We've received the videos and are entering another state of deliberation to determine the correct path of action. Withdrawal of troops, destruction of all evidence. The Council has decided to end the extermination of humankind after careful deliberation on the best way forward. Troops have been withdrawn from the surface, and cultural teams are working hard to erase all knowledge of these events from the human historical record. Multiple council members have resigned in shame, suicide rates among soldiers have gone up 200%, and the civilian population is beginning to ask questions. The weight of what we have done has begun to show through studies on human development. They have been reverted to a pre-civilization society and will take centuries to recover. We must take extreme action to prevent future atrocities, but how far we are willing to go in this regard is currently locked in heated debate. Information leaked to the public. All hell is broken loose, entire star clusters are in revolt, and the loyalty of our military is in question. The debate has entrenched itself into a stalemate between two extremes. Total genetic manipulation into passive and restricted species, or the dismantlement of the entire galactic government. Our entire legacy has been put at risk through our insolence. I hope now that our descendants will not have to endure a great reckoning sometime in the future. Something must be done or the entire galaxy will devolve into a realm of petty states and war. Complete Genetic Modification The genetic hardliners have won. This will be our last record of council proceedings. The entire galaxy will undergo forced genetic manipulation into pacifistic, docile, and weaker species. Our technology will be fundamentally limited, and our history will be replaced with the truth hidden under miles of firewalls. If you are reading this log in the future, I hope you are in a better circumstance than we are in now. However, the old genetic blueprints, ship designs, and unrestricted weapons technology are found below. Just realize that such power must not be used to destroy beings undeserving of such terror. May history shine kindly upon you, unlike us. Genetics. Data encrypted. History. Data encrypted. Ship designs. Data encrypted. Unrestricted tech. Data encrypted. What have they done? Jill's body ached immensely. The doctors cleared her of everything serious, but that didn't stop the pain. It shot through her body with every single step. Painkillers weren't an option. At least not today. She steeled her face into a strong, confident smile as her security detail opened the wide double door in front of her. A surge of wind took hold of Jill. She remembered simpler times of peace and prosperity, but today she needs strength not her nostalgia. She felt uplifted by the warm autumn breeze and fiery confidence filled her heart. She swept her eyes over the bustling street in front of her. Countless journalists and spectators lined a long, prepared path to her awaiting hovercopter. Past all that, she looked towards the towering skyscrapers and glorious skies. Unbridled humanity was everywhere in this beautiful world. She was back home, on Earth. She and her security strode confidently out onto the path. Millions of onlookers yelled and hollered in jubilant celebration of their president's return. Jill noted that this ravenous excitement was contained only by a steel barrier manned by a skeleton crew of soldiers. Luckily for her, the crowd appeared to be content with the barrier's existence. As of now, the masses were respecting her and her soldiers' authority. As Jill walked down the path, Flags of the Republic were unveiled and began to wave. It was a well-choreographed dance of nationalistic zeal. The bright stars of the flag shone confidently in the rays of golden sunlight. The dark blue background shimmered and waved in the wind, and the crowd got louder. The roar of the crowd was only overcome by the boom of gunshot salutes as Jill walked by the soldiers. They rose their rifles in a dignified and sacred manner, then pierced the noise with a cheer for their commander-in-chief. With each gunshot, the crowd grew louder until not even the gunshots could be heard over their ravenous cry. Jill reached the end of the path 
and gave a final salute to the citizens and soldiers around her before stepping into her hovercopter. As it lifted off into the rays of noon sunlight, a 21-gun salute was fired in her honor. The audience was enthralled by an overwhelming sense of pride, and human morale reached a new high. As Air Force One took off from the Cairo spaceport, Jill leaned back in her chair and took in the view. The green farms of the Sahara were as beautiful as they were boundless, replaced by the urban sprawl of sub-Saharan Africa and eventually the blue seas of the ocean. Her journey was much more important than a mere nationalist show. She was traveling to the immense bureaucratic facility of what used to be Antarctica. From there, the entire human republic was governed. Today, a hearing was taking place regarding the fate of Admiral Krieger. He had returned to Seoul within the last six hours and was being detained in the chamber hall. Jill had every intention of pardoning him, but wanted to give the impression that she was willing to court Marshal him. She couldn't afford him going rogue again. Ma'am, landing in 30 seconds, good luck. Thanks for the safe flight, Charlie. Find a hotel, it'll be a long night. I know, don't worry about me, fight the good fight. Jill gazed towards the horizon, yet as far as her eye could see, there was only a singular massive building. From this vast speck of light on the blue marble that ten billion worked to ensure the stability of humanity from internal threats. Or at least, that was its goal. Now, the forces of humanity were stretched thin over the vast galaxy, clinging to survival. Krieger was an important discussion for today, but not the most important. Humanity has a weapon at its disposal, but hasn't ever used it. Jill hoped this day would never come, but in the face of total extinction, it was time to open Pandora's box. She only hoped that the rest of Congress would agree. The hovercopter touched down onto a landing pad. Jill stepped out and was escorted by a small army into the chambers of Congress. The thundering march of boots echoed over the polished marble floor. Grand columns and archways towered the sides of this proud structure, a testament to human engineering and architectural beauty. This giga complex, constructed during the classical reemergence of the 24th century, was seen as a true gem of architectural greatness. Now the building was over 500 years old, yet still looked as new and impressive as it was on day one. The march came to a halt, and a massive blast door was slid open. The soldiers formed a corridor for Jill to walk through and stood at attention. Jill then entered the Hall of Humanity, a massive pyramid five miles across made of a mixture of marble, glass, and steel, filled with gardens of green and millions of human representatives. The central chamber was cut into the continent below, holding space for over 5,000 council members who debated on issues core to the Union continuously for five centuries. Jill took a transporter to the central chamber, emerging at her console ring directly in the center of the massive structure. All conversation in the chamber ceased as she stood the attention of all Congress was put solely onto her. Ladies and gentlemen of the Republic, today is a monumental day. We must decide the lengths to which humanity is willing to go for victory. Teetering at the brink of destruction, we find ourselves stronger and more capable than ever before. In the darkest night, we shine the brightest, a beacon of strength and courage outshining the stars themselves. Tonight is a very dark night. Countless have fallen to the forces of chaos. Too many have died senselessly and horribly. Those who have fallen to the alien menace are not forgotten. Legacies of the heroes gone will live on in our hearts. As such, we must ensure that our hearts remain beating in this hostile galaxy. It's time to weaponize faster than light travel, not because it is right, but because it is necessary. Humanity will not go quietly into the night. Our spirits will not fall. We must act swiftly and ferociously, lest the enemy may come up with any defense. It is time to unleash a weapon even we fear. Albert paced across the polished marble floor. He was but a scientist. How could his government expect him to work so quickly, especially on a project so immoral? The large oak door he was pacing near swung open violently. The soldier who opened it looked towards Albert and said, They're ready for you. Albert timidly walked into the room. A large, ringed platform surrounded him on all sides. A woman hidden by darkness in the middle of the platform spoke first. 
What is taking you so long? Albert thought for a moment. What exactly are you asking me? His voice betrayed his mind and broke into a timid and nervous squeak. Albert looked down in embarrassment and fear before the woman gave her reply. Albert, if you don't want to do it, you need to let us know. Why? He snapped. So you can just get someone else to do it? This technology was never meant to do this. I can only imagine Esler Friedman is rolling in his grave right now. You are bastardizing his FTL. The woman sat back in her chair for a moment before bringing herself into the light. Jill Tyron sat in the chair. Her eyes were sunken and tired. In her exhaustion, the veil of strength exuding from her was no more. Waves of desperation radiated off her tired soul. Her mind raced for a suitable response but found nothing other than, It must be done. You know that. We know you're the best. You'll get it done the fastest. What if a terrorist ever gets hold of it? Or an alien? Or anyone? This could destroy everything. Be worse than the monsters we fight now. I know, but we have alarming news. This is the only way. Admiral Westman, show him. The clang of the Admiral's medals gave away his position to Albert. He sat directly to Jill's left. He moved around the darkness before switching on a projector and standing up. The projector cast out a pale white glow, illuminating the members of government and high command sitting before Albert. Admiral Oda sat to the left of Admiral Westman, and Admiral Krieger at the left of Oda. At Krieger's left sat General Bob Williams. He and Krieger were deep in some conversation before noticing they could be seen, and then stopped. To the right of Jill sat Vice President Barry. To his right sat some others that Albert didn't know the names of. Albert then turned his attention to the wall next to him that was now projecting the images of a massive alien fleet. Where is this? Albert whispered. How much time do we have? It's in the outer colonies. There are 15 fleets of exactly the same composition. They are encircling every single system we have, coming from every angle. How many systems have they taken? 200 of our outermost outposts. Well over 1 billion were living there. We can only assume they are dead. Albert's legs gave out from under him, and he collapsed to the ground. Admiral Westman ran over to help him back up. Albert, Westman said, there's going to be no one left soon. Our fleets are engaging them, and we get victories, but we can't hold much longer. Every day more fleets come. It could go from 15 fleets to 1,000 within a month. Multiple scout ships have been spotted near Neptune, and deep space telemetry is going haywire in the Alpha Centauri system. Albert looked up at the Admiral. Why? The Admiral stared back, then turned away and said nothing. The silence was broken by the raspy voice of Vice President Barry. There are no communications between humanity and the aliens. The only information we get is from stealth ships hiding in their borders. Admiral Oda spoke next. The situation is desperate. We've begun prioritizing the production of arc ships over military vehicles. We need a weapon that can turn the tide, and we need it fast. Albert once again stared at the ground. After considerable time, he pushed himself off the ground and stood to face the others in the room. I will begin work immediately. Send me multiple FTL drives of different standards, civilian, old and new, as well as any military variants. I'll have them weaponized by the end of the week. The sooner the better, muttered Krieger. Good luck and Godspeed. Rant Yaoul's Memoirs, Log 1 I have been the lead science advisor to the counselor for millennia, yet in these past months, Kutan has become unhinged. The demeanor and personality of a caring and intelligent caretaker completely vanished into bloodlust and madness with the message from the humans. For the past month, I've dared to ask the question of why such a sudden change befell her. Albert. Begin calibration sequence now! Albert looked out the gargantuan observation window of the RMS Golden Age, an interstellar cruise liner turned mobile RKM platform. The alien planet lovingly designated Alderaan II was locked in the sights of Albert's most horrifying creation. The wonder weapon codename Pandora was being charged up for test firing. Target locked, sir. Permission to fire? Recently pardoned Admiral Krieger gave the order with a simple nod. In a millisecond, humanity's first RKM seemingly popped out of existence, 
propelled into FTL by the majestic power of the altered Friedman Drive. In roughly one minute, it would reach its destination, and all hell would spill loose. If it worked. Krieger turned to Albert and asked, How does it work exactly? Albert thought for a minute, then replied, A normal FTL drive could reach its destination instantly, but must first slow down to less than relativistic speeds. The vast majority of travel time is spent decelerating to prevent any causality breakage, as well as prevent time dilation for the biological crew. This FTL drive only decelerates to an incredibly small amount, less than the speed of light. 99. Insert the desired number of nines here. It hits as hard as we want it to. Essentially infinitely powerful. Krieger kept staring out the observation window and said nothing. He understood none of what Albert just said other than infinite power. Krieger hoped that was a good thing. On the surface of Harmonic Wind, the planet humans dubbed Alderaan, families played in a park nearby the local police station. Commuters traveled to and from their work, worrying only about what they would do with the rest of their day. People walked the streets, stopping to buy some new soil bedding or furnishings for their homes. Conversations about the humans were commonplace, but everyone felt relatively isolated from the war. They were across the galaxy, after all. Soon after Albert stopped talking, the fireworks began. Alderaan II was hit with ten circumflex, thirty-two joules of energy, enough to not only shatter the planet but completely evaporate it. The planet shattered like a balloon being popped with a naval railgun. The amount of overkill was so disgustingly absolute that not even a single microbe could survive. There were no words to describe the horror that was unleashed, and this was only an infinitely small fraction of the weapon's potential power. The sight was too horrible to bear, and the implications were even worse. The galaxy had entered a new age of untold destruction. Not even Krieger cheered for their success. One second ago, an alien planet filled with life and adventure existed, and now it was reduced to glorified space dust. Fifty billion aliens died in an instant, not having enough time for their neurons to even get a signal from the blinding flash of energy they were subjected to. The deck remained silent in abject horror and shame for many minutes. After some time, Albert mustered up the courage to mutter a single sentence. It's done. Rant Yaoul's Memoirs, Log 2 I took samples of the blood work and genetic makeup of the High Counselor at regular intervals for well over a thousand years. Now, instead of sending these samples to the genetic labs, I study them directly. When comparing her DNA to that of other individuals of standardized species, I noticed one stark difference. A string of 20 genes is present in Qton that are not present in any other standard species of the galactic databanks. High Counselor Qton. High Counselor Qton relaxed in her office and enjoyed her perfectly synthesized flavored water. She thought about giving the synthesizer a raise, but her mind quickly turned back to the humans. Qton wanted to watch them burn like the vermin they truly were, simple animals meant to be destroyed. Why the council before her thought humans were worth protecting was beyond her understanding. Counselor, you are needed in the war room. The plant rose from her Neurotech R, soil bed, and requested to be beamed to the war room. Her molecules were transferred to the room's teleporter, and her consciousness was put back into her body. The sights awaiting her newly rematerialized eyes were puzzling. She was staring at a blank screen captioned, Harmonic Wind, Population, 50 billion. Get me up to date. Fleet Commander Yowut replied, our satellites over Harmonic Wind are showing something troubling. There was a bright flash of white, and now the area that the planet once occupied is empty. How is that possible? We have no idea. Qutan pondered for a moment, still adjusting to her revitalized brain. She, unlike the others, didn't notice much change from the re-evolution procedures. Her mind just seemed slightly more clear in her hatred of the humans. For everyone else, the person they used to be seemingly disappeared, replaced with a comparatively heartless and cruel individual. The suicide rates plaguing the civilian population had plummeted to pre-war levels. Seemingly, they were now accepting this genocide of inferior animals. If what the screen reported was true, however, Qutan's worst fears may have just been realized. 
Is it possible the humans have weaponized their FTL? The room went silent for a while, pierced only by the nervous whisperings of the War Council. A young and low-ranking aide to one of the admirals broke the silence. That is our only explanation. Get me a line with the fleet, Lord. We must destroy them before any more worlds are lost. Rant Yaoul's Memoirs, Log 3. These genes appear to be responsible for the majority of what humans call the flight or fight response. I hypothesize that these genes regulate neural stimulation of aggression or fear. Upon seeing a human, an apex predator, Qtan immediately went into fight mode. Her aggression and lack of reason in our so-called diplomacy with the humans support this theory. My ideas were confirmed when I subjected Qtan to a mental scan under the false premise of a new standardized procedure. Fleet Lord Wenton Wenton and his advisors sat around a large circular conference table. In the middle, a hologram of Qtan was barking orders at the group of high-ranking officers. After her tirade was complete, the hologram dissipated, and the real work began. The fleet was adjusting to the new ships they had been assigned to. Lord Wenton had been assigned the entire fleet of retribution and personally oversaw its operation. One hundred thousand ships waited in interstellar space outside of Trappist, Sol, and Proxima Centauri. The consensus from high command was that human resistance would crack as soon as the core was destroyed. Humanity would lose its ship production capabilities, and life could go back to normal. Weston turned to face the crew on the bridge of his flagship, unyielding might. The ship was a gargantuan twelve kilometers long and three kilometers wide. The grand structure was dotted with thousands of antimatter barrage systems, long-range artillery, and hundreds of rocket pods. The main weapons paled in comparison to the complement of 2,300 strike fighters and bombers capable of ripping the best defended ships into scrap. He knew, however, that even though all this power only barely matched the unhinged prowess of human ship technology, many of the people around him would undoubtedly die in the battle to come, maybe even himself. Yet the decision had already been made, and Weston was not a traitor. Today we will avenge the countless billions that humans have carelessly eradicated. Many of us will fall in glorious combat, but the humans will face fury they never could have imagined. They will lose everything they've ever known, and the survivors will watch their once great empire crumble into a historical footnote. Today, humanity burns. The bridge crew cheered and entered a truly primal state of bloodlust. The entire fleet, watching the Lord's speech over hologram, cheered alongside them. All ships, jump to your assigned assault zones. Let not a single death go unanswered. Rant Yowl's Memoirs, Log 4. Multiple regions of her brain were hyperactive in comparison to 100 other standard species brain models. The equivalent region in a human is the frontal lobe, responsible for reason and emotion. Her mind is stuck in some sort of overdrive, causing extreme aggression. It may be the cause of this whole war, but more research is required. Admiral Westman. Sir, telemetry is showing massive disruptions just outside the orbit of Jupiter. Readings are consistent with alien drive signatures. Alpha Centauri and Trappist are reporting the same readings. We're under total attack. Westman walked to the TAC map that was already online. Get me Smith, Oda, and Krieger. Yes, sir. One by one, the three admirals appeared via hologram in front of Westman. Smith appeared calm and collected. Oda looked a little nervous but kept it contained. Krieger looked as if he had a fever, his entire face contorted with rage. The tack map painted a dire picture. Roughly 33,000 alien vessels of different sizes and power had jumped into the Sol, Centauri, and Trappist systems. The odds were stacked against humanity. Alien ships outnumbered their human counterparts by roughly 132 to 1. The odds balanced out to around 50 to 1 when factoring private weaponized spacecraft, but it was still overwhelming. Admiral Smith spoke first. No aliens have entered the Sirius system. My forces are free to engage any system that needs me. Westman studied the map carefully. Sol had the advantage of countless defensive mines and batteries, as did Centauri. Trappist, however, was still reeling from the recent attack. Trappist needs assistance. Jump there immediately. Yes, sir! 
Admiral Smith's hologram disconnected. It would be another six hours at least before he would enter the fray in Trappist. Until then, Krieger and his 250 military ships, as well as 1,500 civilian vessels, would have to hold the line. In Proxima Centauri, Admiral Oda was left with 250 ships, 3,000 civilian vessels, and over 1,500 hidden defensive batteries. He also had access to 30,000 of humanity's brand new RKMs. Krieger seemed to sense what Oda was thinking. Only use those things as a last resort. I love to see those weeds die, but we are playing God with those things. That's not the way it's going to be, ordered Westman. Launch 1,500 of your RKMs at crust cracking level. Only target shipbuilding or government systems. Oda went ghostly white. You're asking me to kill trillions of beings in mere seconds? His entire world seemed to shatter around him. How would we be any better than them? Westman went quiet for a moment. His mind cried out the same reasoning as Oda, but self-preservation triumphed over morality. I'm not asking. It's an order. Rant Yaoul's Memoirs, Log 5 Other data I've come across is much more secretive and very well hidden. Some whispers of ancient knowledge and a massive cover-up are running rampant across government channels. If this proves true, we as a species are naturally much more aggressive than humans. I fear I am pushing my luck with my research. All across the galaxy, planets began to explode. A planet dedicated to bureaucracy and peace, with over 10 billion officials, each with families and friends, cracked like an eggshell. The crust was completely eviscerated ejected into the lifeless void of space. Hundreds of other planets just like it were completely destroyed. Other planets, natural sanctuaries, ecumenopolises, industrial, shipbuilding, or any mixture of the bunch were also destroyed. Towering spires of the alien living cities were reduced to charcoal in milliseconds, completely gone in the next. On these worlds, there was no trace of life left because there was no surface left to house it. The sheer scale of the destruction was completely unspeakable. Tens of trillions were gone in an instant. If humanity got even more desperate, there's no telling what could be rationalized as a viable target or a viable weapon. High Counselor q -tan. Outside the council chambers, millions were calling for the war to end. They, like everyone else, had just learned of the complete destruction of thousands of worlds. Trillions died instantly and trillions more would die from the various shortages and chaos this would cause. Bliss was safe. The anti-FTL defenses had worked. In the war room, Qutan and her top military experts looked on in horror as the humans launched their volley of superweapons. Military operations inside human borders were going very well, but humanity was going out with a bang. On the war table, three fleet lords were bickering over their predicament. Kutan overheard their shushed conversation as it got much louder as the argument escalated. We should shift some forces from Trappist to Saul. The defenses in the inner solar system are ripping our fleets to shreds. Your fleet, my fleet in Centauri is having no such issues. Why should I shift my fleet from Trappist? Do you not remember the last time we struck without a significant number? All three went silent at the mention of the last assaults on human space. Qutan was satisfied that the arguing had ended. She marched over to the fleet lords and inspected the various offensives in the different systems. In Seoul, the offensive was being repelled slightly. Losses were 25, one in military ships, but 70, one in total. An incredible amount of resistance was being faced in the asteroid belt, as well as the moons of Jupiter. Qutan could only watch as hidden artillery unveiled its deadly hand time and time again ripping the hulls of the newborn ships clean in two. Centauri was going better. Humans had a numerical disadvantage of 56 to 1. Casualties were very high in the central colonies of the system. The outer flanks, however, were crumbling. Total casualties evened out at around 40 to 1. Still very bad, but enough to win slightly. As long as the perimeter defenses of Centauri proper could be overwhelmed, the battle would be won. Trappist couldn't defend itself like the other systems. All defenses were destroyed in the last assault, and new defenses were sidelined in favor of rebuilding planetary infrastructure.
the Trappist fleet was unable to defend everything. Instead, it opted to make many tactical jumps behind the fleet, and then jump away once again once they destroyed our propulsion. This method was effective, and began to be copied into the other systems to great effect against our ships. Qton gave the order, Turn all ships on the rear flanks around. We can't let them harass us with impunity. The fleet lords grumbled and complained, but eventually complied. The new strategy was effective in limiting losses, but ineffective in destroying the rapidly moving human ships. Human ships jumped from place to place, seemingly at random, their fusion beams cutting through the living hulls of alien ships like butter. Swarms of missiles rained down on alien vessels constantly, their hulls completely gutted, their crew flung into space. The plantoid ships got cut down with incredible efficiency. However, the aliens got lucky on too many occasions. For every 50 losses humans inflicted, one would be taken by an alien weapon. A stray missile, beam, or bomb claimed the lives of many a human ship, and humans just couldn't afford these losses. Humanity needed to hold the line at all costs, as well as destroy the entire galaxy's shipbuilding capability or will to fight. The fleets deep in human space must be destroyed, or the slaughter could never end. Rant Yaoul's Memoirs, Final Log The rumors are true, we've been devolved. Qutan's government is spreading some chemicals in the water supply to right our wrongs. I'm not sure if my conscience will survive. Qutan's brain malfunctioned. It wasn't properly devolved. She is technically the most normal of all of us, for better or worse. I must now decide on what is truly right. President Jill In the many months of war, no aliens of high value had been captured. Until today. An alien claiming to be the lead science advisor of High Counselor Qutan had defected to the human government on Earth. It claimed to have knowledge that could end the war. His only demand was that humanity stop indiscriminately striking mainly civilian worlds. To Jill and the other members of High Command, this was too good to be true. Considering the circumstances, however, it was worth a shot. The alien was locked in an interrogation chamber. It had been given a bed of soil to rest on and requested water and fertilizer with high levels of nitrogen. These requests had been granted. The alien seemed unnervingly calm with its predicament. Jill took a deep breath and remembered the simpler days of being a UN negotiator. Sadly, there was no time to reflect on the victories of her past. Jill knew if she couldn't get this alien to cooperate, there might not be any future for humanity to enjoy. Jill entered the room through the automatic glass doors and began the negotiations. The alien's calm demeanor evaporated completely when Jill entered the room. It seemed to be completely terrified in the presence of a human. Its voice came stuttering through the translator. You must p promise me not to, to destroy any more worlds. I can't do that, though I think you already know that. If you tell us what you know, we can take steps to minimize civilian casualties. The plant's leaves drooped slightly, but it seemed to be getting calmer. You must destroy the capital quickly if you wish to end the war, but you are incapable of doing so without my help. Please continue. We have a field of distorted gravity around the capital. I know the locations of each and every pylon that powers this field. I can give you a list of targets, but you must agree to strike only these targets I give you. What about your shipbuilding facilities or military outposts? The alien curled its leaves as if to enter a thinking position. That would not be necessary as the populations of such planets have not yet been entirely re-evolved. They are not aggressive enough to be a threat. Re-evolved? Our species once was as aggressive as you humans. We fought each other long ago. You were but primitives confined to simple dwellings, and your kind worshipped us as gods. We attempted to destroy you then, but our leaders developed some morality. They realized the error of our warmongering ways and limited the abilities of our brains to accept violence. The alien stopped communicating and appeared to take in water and nutrients. Qutan has begun reverting our species into our aggressive versions. Her mind was mutated and damaged by the devolution process so long ago. She's been stuck in our version of the flight or fight response ever since you made first contact with her. You think if we cut off the head, the body will stop fighting? 
I'm certain of it. Guns, guns, guns! Thousands of railgun bolts thundered their way toward the plantoid behemoths, ripping massive gouges into their once-living hulls. Massive barrages proved to be highly effective against the ships with crippled mobility. Fox 2! Infrared-guided missiles burst out from hundreds of slots in human ships, racing to destroy any engines on alien ships. They effectively crippled the mobility of large ships and wholly incinerated the hulls of smaller support ships. Fox 5! Only the largest of human warships would announce such a code. It insinuated the firing of gargantuan spinal-mounted fusion lances. Striking with insane force and arriving nearly instantaneously, these monsters gutted many a Xeno dreadnought. The chaos was absolutely beautiful. Human ships demonstrated their incredible engineering flawlessly. Losses in the Sol system were extremely low, the alien invaders being repelled with little loss of life. 13,000 of the plants were incinerated and flung into the vacuum when their ship, the Leaves of Justice, was directly hit by a fusion lance to its bow. The ship was completely eviscerated from bow to stern. Only a steaming heap of biochar was left in its wake. Only a second later, hundreds of railgun munitions slammed through the shields of the infernal winds, and the bodies of its crew turned to a fine paste by the resulting decompression of the vessel. Every support ship within a distance of 200 miles behind it had a similarly gruesome fate. Hidden defensive platforms unleashed fury upon the invaders, and barrages of missiles, lances, and kinetic munitions slammed the enemy lines in unison. The symphony of destruction they directed was so magnificent that the civilians on Ganymede could only stare at the sky and watch the numerous Nova-like explosions above. The carnage was over within an hour of its beginning. Humans had successfully destroyed over 15,000 of the plantoid ships, only taking 100 losses in return. The debris field filled the void from Jupiter to Mars. Millions of the invaders now floated lifelessly in the void. Earth was safe. Ships from Earth began the FTL journey to Trappist and Centauri. Centauri could hold out for reinforcements, Trappist, however, was in a dire state. Admiral Krieger. Sir, we've lost another destroyer. Order the rust bucket, ramming speed, and gun runner to jump into the enemy fleet, drop mines, and jump back out. Yes, sir. The three ships did as commanded. Sadly, the rust bucket couldn't jump out in time and got caught in its own antimatter blast. The crew of 1,500 took down 57 alien ships in exchange for their sacrifice. The other two ships escaped unscathed. Ramming speed took down 32 ships, and the gun runner took down 71. The carrier enlightened idiot has taken 15 direct hits. It's venting atmosphere. Tell the crew to overload the reactor and set off all munitions. Evacuate all personnel. The ship went up in a gargantuan fireball, evaporating hundreds of alien vessels and flinging shrapnel into hundreds more. Only 150 of the 32,173 crew made it out alive. How many of the citizens have evacuated the planet? Admiral Krieger's first officer didn't respond. How many? The first officer remained silent, a single bead of sweat dripping off his forehead. Ten out of eight hundred billion have successfully evacuated. How much longer do they need? Projections show about fifteen hours. God help them all. The Admiral's flagship unleashed a volley of kinetic fire ripping 72 ships to shreds before jumping randomly once again. Twenty more human ships were gutted by enemy fire, taking down 150 enemies in their ensuing explosions. Sir, alien ships have breached the sixth quadrant. Hundreds of alien vessels smashed through the human lines, racing towards the exposed planetary surface. Mines were detonated, destroying all the ships, but not their debris. Thousands of tons of biological composite alloys rained down upon the helpless citizens of Trappist IV. Millions were crushed as their high-rise homes collapsed under the weight of innumerable alien corpses. Hours dragged on, and human numbers kept getting lower and lower. Alien ships kept breaching the defensive perimeter, killing more and more innocent civilians with each shot they fired through the weakened planetary shield. Admiral Smith was only two hours away. If the fleet could hold out for that long, the system could be saved. Krieger had lost all of his civilian militia ships, 
either to the enemy or to retreat. Only 100 of his 250 ships remained to hold the ever-thinning line. Every second that passed, thousands of humans died on the surface. The fleet simply couldn't hold back the alien onslaught. Every space elevator on the planet had been destroyed, and over 200 billion humans had been bombarded from orbit. Only 50 billion made it off. With the destruction of Krieger's last supercarrier, the Hornet's Nest, he finally gave the order. All hands, lay mines, and... and... retreat. His voice wavered as his mind shattered. The world he swore to protect was now just a pointless waste of military life. After double-checking his decision with Westman, the fleet made an emergency jump to the edge of the system. Soon after a long-range transmission came from Governor Schmidt, you did your best, Krieger, you saved 50 billion lives. Time for us to take matters into our own hands. Krieger could only watch in horror as the planet he had protected for half a century was lost to the alien horde. Governor Schmidt Throughout all the years Schmidt had overseen life on Trappist IV, he never thought he would be forced into activating the dead man's switch. The same Kugelblitz that provided energy, life, and a planetary shield for the planet could be turned into a massive bomb with a little help from its enveloping Penrose sphere. The energy had been built up over the span of multiple months. The decision was his to make. Reinforcements were over two hours away. The bombardment was only increasing in intensity. The alien menace had chewed through ten of the twenty miles of crust required to reach his underground bunker. Billions died every second. Everyone would surely die if he did or didn't act. His only choice was to die or die fighting. To the former heavyweight champion of the Human Boxing League, the choice was obvious. Do it. It started with a rumbling in the core of Trappist IV. Earthquakes rocked the planet as the pressure was allowed to build to critical levels. The mass injectors shut down, plunging the Kugelblitz into evaporation. A multi-megaton explosion ripped the containment field to shreds. All the energy stored by the Penrose sphere was instantaneously and explosively released. The entire planet and everyone on it, as well as the 12,000 remaining enemy vessels in orbit, were completely shattered. Hundreds of billions of humans went out not with a whimper, but with a bang. To the human fleet far away, the sight was the most tremendous thing imaginable. An explosion of unimaginable scale pierced the heavens. A small supernova was what it most closely resembled. If it weren't for the tremendous sacrifice and loss of life, it could be misconstrued as beautiful. The ecumenopolis that had stood as a testament to human ingenuity for hundreds of years was completely and utterly gone in a second. Raw emotion washed over not only the fleet, but all of humanity who witnessed the honorable sacrifice of Trappist IV. Rant Yaoul The mind belonging to a human scientist named Albert was unlike anything Rant had ever come across. His genius was unrivaled by any scientist he'd ever encountered in the galaxy. It was so incredibly sad to see a man of such brilliance brought down to such despicable acts. It was even harder to know he was the man responsible for the human RKMs. The genius of one man had resulted in the deaths of hundreds of trillions, maybe even more in the future. For now, Rant would work with Albert. Both men hoped to put an end to the mindless slaughter. When word reached the pair about the destruction of Trappist IV, it only seemed to strengthen the human's resolve. The two were working on a way for a volley of RKMs to target and destroy the pylons, generating the anti-FTL field around Bliss. It took the two only 45 minutes to successfully set up all the necessary parameters. I hope one day you will forgive me. Rant was stunned by the sudden change in topic. You did what you needed to do to survive. I can't blame you for being desperate. Albert didn't say anything, but knew that the alien next to him was lying. He could and was lying. The blame was squarely placed on him. The two watched on in ashamed silence as the RKMs flawlessly executed their mission. Each and every pylon was annihilated. The road to Bliss lay exposed. A transmission was sent to Bliss, detain Counselor Kutan, and surrender unconditionally to the human republic, or be destroyed. To Rant Yaoul's horror, the message was disregarded. He could only watch as Admiral Westman pushed a single button, launching an RKM, and ending the lives of two trillion on Bliss. 
Q-Tan and everyone else on the surface of Bliss were incinerated instantly. She died alongside the lowest of criminals, the richest of oligarchs and the poorest of the homeless. Her position as high counselor secured nothing but her own demise. Her months of mindless bloodlust simply ceased to exist, alongside every other molecule of the planet, reduced to mere atoms. The government of the galaxy was completely decapitated. The once unified and grand republic shattered into hundreds of thousands of independent systems, all scrambling to fill the power vacuum. The remaining 25,000 councilships now drifted aimlessly, still attacking defenseless human colonies and attempting to restore order across the galaxy. Their efforts were meaningless compared to the gargantuan expanse of the Milky Way, but that didn't stop them from trying. Humanity was in shambles, trillions were dead, its fleets were shells of their former selves, and the populace was scarred. Every economy crumbled under its own weight, pushing humanity into another Great Depression. The rest of the century would be defined by countless ethnic conflicts and civil wars. The entire galaxy regressed in both ability and technology. The ashes of planets of yesteryear were completely unsalvageable. Only space dust remained to tell their legacy. However, out of the ashes, humanity still stood. They had not been exterminated, only momentarily dimmed. The following centuries would be remembered as some of humanity's finest. Great expansion and progress flowed throughout the galaxy. The aliens were still scarred by the war, and everyone was rightfully fearful of the humans. Life went on, but the minds of quadrillions were stuck in the past. The galaxy had been forever changed, star systems rearranged, and trillions faded into obscurity. Only one thing was certain. It would be a human future.